Harvest Holiday greetings, everybody. I'm John Fedko. Tonight, as we approach the final hours of 1997, baseball fans in Pittsburgh and across the nation look back. We look back across two and a half decades with a note of sadness. Tomorrow night, New Year's Eve, marks the 25th anniversary of the passing of a legend. It was New Year's Eve 1972 when the world lost one of its true sports heroes, Roberto Clemente. The 38-year-old Pirates outfielder was on a relief mission to earthquake-torn Nicaragua. Flying out of his homeland of Puerto Rico, Roberto went against warnings his old DC-7 was seriously overloaded. Just minutes after takeoff, the plane carrying food, clothing, and medical supplies went down off the coast of San Juan. That plane has never been found. Less than three months before his untimely death, Roberto Clemente sat down with my colleague, Sam Nover. Sam talked with Roberto at length about baseball, life, and even death. Tonight, 25 years later, the Pittsburgh Cable News Channel is proud to present in its entirety Sam Nover's interview with Roberto Clemente. After 25 years, the quality of the recording, of course, is a little compromised, but the content is well worth our attention. Here now is Sam Nover and Roberto Clemente. People like Joe Namath and Muhammad Ali, for example, who could easily be categorized with you, Roberto, in the greatness as an athlete, uh, have no inhibitions at all about allowing the, the public to come into their private life. Maybe they do secretly, but certainly they don't disguise it. Uh, how do you feel about athletes like Namath and Ali, for example, who, whose exploits uh, the whole world knows about? Well, I would say that uh, it's a little different matter with uh, Ali because uh, I really admire this man because uh, I don't. Mind, I might not go with all the ideas that he has. I think that everybody thinks different. I don't. I don't go for all the ideas that he has as a as a professional athlete. I admire him a lot because uh, he's a very intelligent person. Um, uh, most of the things that he go in public and the acts that he put in public, he doing himself a promotion for his fight, which is his job, and I admire him for that. Uh, Neymar's, uh, uh, the nation make him an idol and uh, is uh, they trying to, uh, they make him a playboy and a lover boy which uh, <laughs> this is something that had to grow in the, in the person also. And uh, I don't say one thing or the other because as long as they do their job, uh, that's their business. But to me I cannot be like that. I, I, I got to rest, I, I had to rest as much as I can. And uh, I think that, that to me it's a little, a little different story because I think that I belong to the minority group. I am Puerto Rican, I'm black, and I have, uh, I'm between the walls. So anything that I do, first, I, re I will be reflected on me because I'm black, and second, I will be reflected on me because I am Puerto Rican. But with this one, I tell you that to me, uh, I always respect everybody, and thanks to God, when I grew up, uh, I was raised. Uh, I was I was raised, and when I, my mother and father never told me to hate anyone, or they never told me to dislike anybody because they're race or color. We never talk about that. I, the matter of fact, I I started listening to this stuff when I came to this state. So to me, I would say that uh, this is something that uh, I love everybody and. Uh, and I have to be very careful what I do because wh who I am. So I'll give you an example. I was in New York one time buying fur some furniture, and uh, the people out there, my wife was, uh, was going to have a baby. And when we used to go around, and the people, they, uh, they meet us at the door, and they said, they, what do you want? They said, we would like to see the showroom and see some furniture. And they said, well, let's wait for a little bit, and uh, we're going to send somebody to the last floor to see what we have. So they said that uh, they have one floor of furniture. And uh, mm. so they took us to a real, real uh, place where they, they, they show the, the furniture that was in the showroom wasn't the furniture that they were showing up upstairs. And I said, we would like to see the furniture downstairs that was in the showroom. And they said, well, you don't have enough money to buy that. <laughs> and I said, how do you know that I don't have enough money? He said, well, but that's very expensive. I said, I would like to see it because I have the right to see it as a human being, as a public that buy from you. So finally they show it to us. And I remember I just uh, uh, had some money. Uh, uh, we was going to Europe and I had some money on my, on my, on my wallet. I had $5,000 in my wallet, which I took the, 
the whole amount of money. I said, do you think this one can buy it? <laughs> so they want to know who I was and uh, all this stuff. And uh, I, uh, when they found who I was, so they said, we have seven stores. Seven, sto seven, sto seven floors full of furniture, and we're going to show it to you, and don't worry about it. And you know, you was, you, we thought that you was like another Puerto Rican. And right away, I just got mad. I said, look, your business is to sell to anybody. I don't care if I'm Puerto Rican or I'm Jewish or I'm whatever you want to call me. But you see, this is what it really get me mad, because I am Puerto Rican. You treat me different from the other people. I have the same American money that you I asked me for, but I have a different treatment. With right now, you give me my wife a, a different treatment, and myself and my friend that they are Puerto Rican. So I don't want to do anything about it. I don't want to buy your, your furniture. So I walk out. We were talking. That's a terribly interesting, fascinating story. We were talking just a moment ago about Namath. Uh, I believe this week, the week that Roberto Clemente got his 3,000th hit and joined perhaps the most elite circle of baseball players in history. Joe Namath appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated. The article on Roberto Clemente amounted to one line or I think two sentences on page 45 or 50 or something like that in the magazine. And it really graphically portrays what you have talked about for 18 years, that if you don't live in New York or Los Angeles, no matter how great you are, you don't get the kind of exposure that the other athletes do. Well, Sam, with my problem with me is this, that the uh See, when I started playing in 1955, uh, the players, they couldn't open their mouths. Because I remember that lots of players, uh, they, went, they, sent, they were sent to the minors because they opened their mouths. And the organization, they didn't like the way he spoke, or something like that, they chipping down. So when I came, I remember that every time that I used to read a paper of a Latin player, or a black player, they always had to say something sarcastic about it, for example. The first day that I got to, ta to Fort Myers, that was a, a, a newspaper down there, where the newspaper said Puerto Rican hot dog arrived in town. So now, these people never knew nothing about me, but they knew I was a Puerto Rican. As soon as I got to camp, they uh, told me of a Puerto Rican hot dog. Now, now, this is something that I refused to admit, and I talked to some of the Latin players, which and that particular time, they was in the, in, the, in the major league, and they told me, Roberto, you better keep your mouth shut because you know they will ship you back. I said, I don't care one way or the other. If I'm good enough to play here, I have to be good enough to be treated like the rest of the players. So I don't want to be put in the bathroom because I came here from Puerto Rico. I want to be right there in front of everybody. And this is something that uh, from the first day, I said to myself, I am the poor people, I represent the, the common people of America, so I'm going to be treated as a, or a Puerto Rican or nothing like that. I want to treat like any person that come for a job, and every person that come for a job, no matter who he is or what kind of a race or color he is, if he do the job, he should be treated like, uh, like, like white. When we return, Roberto talks about the discrimination that existed during his years in baseball. We used to travel in a, in a station wagon because uh, we could not eat where the white player used to eat. You have admired uh, for a great many years the late Martin Luther King. You knew him and you knew him quite well. Um, is it not true that you believe that in, in many ways he kind of changed the entire lifestyle for the American black? I believe that this man not only changed the style of the American black, I think he changed the life of everybody. Uh, when Martin Luther King started doing the, his, uh, his work and campaigning and uh, you know, we used to go to the south. You know, we used to travel in a, in a station wagon because uh, we could not eat where the white player used to eat. Now, we are in Florida, not too far from Puerto Rico, and you see the white player go to a restaurant, and, uh, and they said, fellow, do you want anything to eat? Now, we are sitting in the back of the, uh, we are sitting in the bus. We didn't go sitting in the back of the bus, but we were sitting inside the bus. And uh, I remember I told a fellow, one of the players, I said, look, if you ever said anything, from anybody from that restaurant, you and me, we're going to have it. We're going to have a fight because I think it's unfair. If uh, this is the way it's going to be, this is the way we're going to suffer. So now, I don't want you to, no of you fellows, to eat anything. So we start right there until I talk to Joe Brown. I said, this is it. I don't, I don't travel no more with the bus. If we cannot eat where the white player is, I don't go and go with the bus. 
So Joe Brown said, well, we're going to get a station wagon for you fellas to travel, and we, we was traveling a station wagon. And uh, when Martin Luther King started doing what he did, he changed the whole system of the American style. He put the people, the ghetto people, the people that don't have nothing, they don't have no saying in those days, they start saying what they would like to say for many years that nobody listened to. Now these men, these people come down to, 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 to the places where they're supposed to be ignored and they don't want them and sit down there and peaceful wise, they make, they call the attention of the whole world. Now that, that wasn't only the black people, but the minority people, the people that don't have anything and they don't have nothing to say in those days because they don't have any power, they start saying things and they start picketing and they start doing what they thought for a long time that they should have a comment. And that I think that the, that the, that the reason that I said he changed the whole world because even in Russia, you saw after what happened in Russia that the kids were picketing in schools. And this is something that never happened before and, 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 and in this state and also in Europe. After this break, Roberto on his childhood and growing up in Puerto Rico. So I grew up with people that really had to struggle to live. Perhaps the, the biggest Achilles heel, the biggest thorn in your side, so to speak, has been some members of the press. Uh, some of them come away from, from seeing you for the first time in a locker room and say, uh, uh, Clemente's a mean man, he frowns, the man never smiles. Uh, is that true? What is really the, the, the makeup of your personality? Is, is perhaps the shape of your face such that you don't smile too often? Well, there's nothing wrong with my teeth, you can't see it. Uh, I got teeth. I thanks to God. Uh, Sam, this is something that I tell you. Uh, when I was a little kid, uh, I born to, to be a, boy, a baseball player. I, this is something that I, I, I think about. The more I think about it, I convinced that God wants me to play baseball. And more than that, I think I came to the, uh, to the world for some reason. Uh, when I was a little kid, I, the only thing I used to do was playing ball all the time, with a paper ball, with a roller ball, with a tennis ball. We used to make our own balls and stuff like that. And uh, my mother had to really work. My mother used to get up at 1 o'clock in the morning, and she had to work and make lunch for these people that used to work in the sugar cane plantation where my father worked. Now, my mother never went to a show. My mother never went. She didn't know how to dance till today. She's 80 years old. But even, even that the, 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 the way that we used to live, I was so happy because my brother and my father and my mother, we used to get together at night and we sit down and make jokes and we used to eat whatever we had to eat. And this is something that was wonderful to me. So I grew up with people that really had to struggle to live. They, I, I, you don't imagine how these people, I used to work with my father when I was, eight years old. And the vacation time, I went to buy a bicycle. It took me three years to collect $27 to buy a bicycle. So I bought a second-hand a hand bicycle. In three years, I used to make a penny a day uh, going from one place to the other to get a, a big can of milk for these people. They give me 30 or 31 cents a month to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to do this for these people. But I said, okay, I, I, my father used to say, I want you to be a good man, I want you to learn how to work, and I want you to be a serious person. Which I grew up with that in my mind, and more than that, I laugh when I have to laugh, but the, my face is that kind of a face, that I cannot be like Manny Sanguillan, for example. His uh, shape of the, of the teeth is uh, they are in a kind of a, a different shape of mind. So no matter if he's mad or not, you might think that he's laughing, which he's not laughing. Now, you might think that I'm uh, serious, which I'm not serious. This is the way that I am. And I like to be that way because sometimes you are uh, smiling, and then the next time you don't see me smiling, and you say, hey, what's wrong with you? So now, I'm natural. This is the way I am. I, nobody can say, uh, well, Roberto is mean. I might look mean, but uh, I, I, I really respect people. 
Do you, do you think that uh, the fact that you are like you are uh, in facial expression makes you sometimes unapproachable? Uh, a reporter comes in and sees Clementi perhaps stalking around the clubhouse with that, that, that particular expression on his face and say, oh my goodness, how can I go near the great Roberto Clementi when he doesn't look happy? Well, I tell you one thing. I tell you the truth. I, I don't like lots of writers. This is, this is something <laughs> I don't want to deny it, and I know. I tell you why I don't like lots of writers. The writers live of what we do. They might write about sport, about football, whatever they want to write, that's fine. I think if I was a writer, the first thing I would try to do is have a good relation with the players. I never criticize a writer that I think that he's sincere or what he's writing. But lots of these writers, they go to you, and they, they put the interview in a way that they sound like you have said that when you don't say exactly that, see? Now, when I, when I was... It's commonly called misquoting. We do that a lot. Right, right. So now, this is something that, to me, in the year that I have here in Pittsburgh, I tell you, 1960, for example, I got dressed in a hurry. I was mad because uh, there was some, uh, the writer wasn't giving me any credit for the most valuable player. Now, I was so mad because of that. I was, I was mad because the approach that these writers have toward this, uh, this uh, most valuable player stuff. This is something that all my life I feel bad about it because I think that this is the wrong approach, but I know it's like politics. You take this thing, sometimes like politics. So I went to Los Angeles and this writer said to me, who is the most valuable player in the thing? I said, we have a few that could be the most valuable player. He said, you see this letter? This letter? He said, you're never going to be because this fellow is making propaganda for this fellow to be the most valuable player. So that day during the World Series, which I always loved the fans, I went to, to the dressing room, I got dressed in a hurry, I uh, took one of the Bill Masaroski gloves and I put it in my back, uh, so I said I'm going to take this to remember Bill Masaroski, so I took it. And I, went, I got dressed in a hurry, I went outside of Fort Field. So I was happy with the fans, I was cheering, I was crying with the fans. Right away, I was, I was real bad, uh, they said that Roberto attitude toward his teammates, something uh, that, uh, that it can, it can ha we can hardly say hmm. what he was his aptitude to what his teammate. When they were celebrating, he went outside. But you I, wanted to be with the people. I want to be with the people that pay my salary. Because I was with my, with my players, I shake hands with them and everything like that. I talked to them about how happy I was and everything like that. But to me, I felt I want to be outside with the fans. So I was criticized for that. In our last segment, Roberto talks about his plans for his life after baseball. So I don't worry one way or the other. I just worry that I be healthy, I live it long enough to, to, to educate my sons and make them respect people, I respect them. Bobby, at 38 years old and 18 years in the major leagues and having accomplished just about everything there is to accomplish in baseball, I guess the thought enters your mind that one of these days it's going to be all over. Um, do you have any idea now when it will be over and when it comes, what are you going to do with your life? What would you like to do? What I would be, I tell you the truth, I never think about that. Uh, people always ask me, uh, how much money do you have? What's going to happen to you? Are you secure? I don't worry about that, Sam. The only thing I worry is about being healthy. If I can live, if I can, uh, for example, uh, have my health, I could work. I don't care if I'm a janitor. I don't care if I drive a cab. As long as I have a decent job, I will work. I know like some of the fellows that they've been rich and they lost everything that they have and they kill, kill themselves because of the money. So to me, I can be a person uh, like me today that I'm making pretty good money, but at the same time, I live a life of a common fellow. I know the big shot. If you go outside the ballpark, you're never going to see me uh, trying to put a show or try to call the attention for anybody because that's the way I am. I, I'm a quiet fellow, and you see me with the same people all the time. If you want to be my friend, you got to prove to me that you are, want to be my friend, and you want to to, to be aware that I need lots of time when I play baseball. Now in the winter time, we can be as, as long as you want to be with me in the winter time, we can spend as much time as you want to be. But in the summer time, then we have to uh, cut it short. So I would say that I don't worry about, 
Uh, what I'm going to do after uh, high school playing baseball, probably I will stay in some capacity in baseball. And uh, But I said to you, I don't worry one way or the other. I just worry that I be healthy, I live it long enough to, to, to educate my sons and make them respect people, I respect them. And uh, this is something that, that to me, this is my biggest worry, is to live to my kids to be a person where everybody, when they look at them, respect them, and they vice versa, they respect the people. Bobby, what do you want for your two sons, three sons, really? What do you want for them out of life? I, will, I want uh, them to enjoy life the way I enjoy life. I love people, and I love the minority people. I love people that they are not big shots. I like common people. I like workers. I like people that suffer. Because these people, they have a different approach of life of the people that they really have everything in life that sometimes they get bored because they have everything and they don't know what suffering is in life. So I want my people, my kids to suffer. I want them to have what they're supposed to have, but I don't want them to be rich. I want them to be people like the normal people in America and the normal people in the whole, in the whole, whole world. Bobby, I can only say 30 minutes is gone like five minutes, and uh, thank you for making it perhaps uh, the most memorable 30 minutes of my life in this business. Uh, I uh, greatly admire you, and I know I speak for everybody watching this program and everybody who has ever known a thing about Roberto Clemente, not only as a baseball player, but as a man. You are a great tribute to society, to America, to Pittsburgh, and obviously to Puerto Rico. And I wish you good health and good luck, and thanks for all the great memories. Uh, well, Sam, I just uh, have to say that uh, the, tribute, the biggest tribute paid to me have been paid by the Puerto Rican people and the Pittsburgh fans. Like I said before, and I'm not trying to uh, make a big issue out of this, but these people have been wonderful to me, and I think they have pushed me to accomplish what I have, have accomplished, because uh, by the way they treat me, I said that the only thing I had to do is to try to sacrifice myself more and try to pay them with the same tribute that they pay me. God Thank bless you. you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank Roberto Clemente. Twelve All-Star games. Four separate National League batting titles. Gold Glove winner for 12 consecutive years. Hall of Famer. Legend. Humanitarian. Had he lived, Roberto would now have been 63 years young. Although the man himself is no longer with us, a part of his spirit, what he stood for, will always be with us. For the Pittsburgh Cable News Channel, I'm John Petko. Good night.